and there is a task of photographic evidence of God. More than 200 photographs of God. So this is the white paper that we are going. In Bangladesh, we can say briefly, as we all know, the Bangladesh was created as a secular democratic country. If you look into our 72's constitution, secularism, democracy, Bengali nationalism, and socialism was a basic principle of the newly republic state of Bangladesh. What, and moreover, there was an excellent, you know, uh, uh, concept in our con constitution that religion-based political parties were prohibited by section 37C. It is something very unique. Even the Western countries that promote secularism, uh, democracy, or human rights, such clause I have not found in any Western constitution, but Bangladesh constitution is that strict. It is something very unique that prohibited party like Jamaat Islami and all these a fundamentalist extremist political parties. It was prohibited constitutionally. But after the assassination of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, you know that Zia Rahman removed, wiped out secularism and ban on religion based political parties, Bengali nationalism, socialism, everything from the constitution. And they put Bismillah Rahman Rahim on the top of the constitution and they included absolute faith on Allah should be the basic guidance of all activities. So thus, this constitution became a very communal constitution, a very progressive, secular, magnificent constitution, became a very narrow communal constitution. And later, you know, when General Rashad has power, he introduced Islam as a state religion. So, when we discuss about secularism in Bangladesh, that is something also very unique, what Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman explained. It is quite different from secularism of Turkey, which is introduced by Kamala Tatur, and secularism of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Mujib categorically mentioned secularism means not absence of religion, negation of religion. Secularism means the estate and politics should be separated from religion. In personal, private life, everybody has freedom to preach, uh, uh, practice the religion, preach religion. Socially, they can practice religion, but only political parties were prohibited, religion-based political parties were prohibited, and religion was separated from a state affairs and government affairs. So that was his view, and I think that is the very correct view for the Asian countries, as in Europe, the way secularism is, you know, identified or, you know, defined. It is a bit different from Bangladesh. Even then, those, in those days, even now, the Islamist parties, they criticized that Sheikh Mujib secularism was a negation of religion which is not true. We have seen people practiced religion freely. There was no persecution in the name of religion. But, well, there one point has to be noted that we had one black law, repressive law since Pakistan period, that is Enemy Property Act. As you may know that after the 65 war, government of Pakistan declared the properties of Hindus, those who left Pakistan at that time, that those properties would be considered as enemy property. And later, Pakistan, you know, after signing this Tashkent Agreement and in 1969, in West Pakistan, they have never, you know, practiced or, you know, they were never followed this Enemy Property Act, but in Bangladesh, during our league time, during Sheikh Mujib's time, just the name was changed. It named as from Enemy Property Act to it became the Wasted Property Act. But essence of the law, act was very much there. And by this act, you know, there is an estate sponsorship to grab properties of the Hindus and also Christians and Buddhists. 
we have a misconception that only the Hindus are the victims of the enemy property act. It is not true. We have seen Buddhist property and Christian property, absent in you know, landlords and others, their property were being trapped by the government and later it was been given to their workers, supporters. And this, is, this law prevailed even in 72 to 75 when we have, Bangladesh was a very secular country. That is one criticism about Mujib, <coughs> Sheikh Mujib's government. But apart from this, we have seen the secularism we practiced for ages in Bangladesh, in our society, that was there only for a few years. Very recently, I attended a conference in Buffalo, you know, and we discussed this, you know, tradition of uh, secular humanism in, the, in that conference. And Dr. Austin of CFI, he mentioned that we, the Americans, we learned uh, secular humanism from Thomas Jefferson. It is just 225 years back. But in Bangladesh, we have seen such secular human legacy for the last 500 years that started from the days of Chundidash. So that is something very interesting to be noted that we have a long tradition of practicing secular human values. And that is enshrined, that was enshrined in our 72's constitution. It was nothing, you know, some discovery or nothing new. But what happened later? When this Islamist grabbed power and when they started promoting this Islam, you know, politics on the basis of Islam, we have seen in, by 78, there were more than 65 Islamic parties, starting from Jamaati Islam, Islami, uh, you know, Nizami Islam, Muslim League. There were 68, you know, nearly 70 parties that registered for, you know, under PPR to the government. And right now, since this four party alliance assumed power, we have more than 71 militant Islamist organizations like Jamaatul Mujahideen, Harkatul Jihad, Lashkar Atayaba, and so on. They are working in Bangladesh. And uh, very recently, you have seen the series of bomb blasts that took place on 17th August, 500 bomb blasts at a time, and it is something unprecedented. So this rise of Islamic militancy, Islamism, or Talibanization of the society of Bangladesh is very much related with the minority persecution because these people who are sharing power with the government, particularly Jamaat Islam and Kujur, they publicly declare before achieving power that they want to see Bangladesh as a monolithic Islamic country like Afghanistan. So it was a very public declaration. It is nothing hidden agenda. They are now implementing their agenda that was declared before assumption of power. So to convert Bangladesh into a monolithic Islamic country, this persecution is very much necessary. Hindus, the way Hindus and Buddhists and Christians are forced to leave Bangladesh, their homeland. Initially, we thought, well, it could be a, some sort of political, you know, post-election political violence, but which is, it was not. It is still continuing. That is just because what I say, that this party, this Jamaat Islami and Islamic Kojot and others, you know, this Islamic militant organization, militant Islamic groups, they do not believe whatever contradictory to their interpretation of Islam. The leaflet distributed by Jamaatul Mujahideen, if you go through the leaflet, I have the copy, English text of the leaflet with me. So if you go through the leaflet, you will find they categorically say that there is no place for the constitution, human constitution written by the human being, and they consider this constitution is written by these infidels, and they want to change, they want to replace this constitution by the constitution of Allah, that is Quran. And they declared the only Quranic rule should be, prevail in Bangladesh. And those who will oppose, they are going to face the consequence. 
and they also want Western powers also. So the agenda is very much clear. These Jamaatul Mujahideen, we have published report that they are linked with Jamaat Islami, they are linked with government, the Jamaat Islami, or this, you know, Bangla Bhai, or similar, all these, you know, militant outputs, they are directly, indirectly, all of them related with Jamaat Islami and Islamic Kojot. So this persecution on the religious and ethnic minorities are very much related with this, you know, rise of Islamic Islamism in Bangladesh, but Islamism, I put it is under quote unquote, maybe it is better to say that the Taliban of Bangladesh is very much related with this minority persecution. In this white paper, one to be noted that, one point to be noted, that we have not included the persecution on the Ahmadiyya Muslims in this book because, well, someone asked me in the, you know, last year, New York's meeting, that why it was not included here, because they considered that our media as a minority, as a you know, matter of minority persecution, but we do believe our medias are not minority. They are Muslims. Their persecution, their, you know, nature of persecution is quite different. It's a matter of fundamentalism. It's a matter of interpretation of Islam, very much related with fundamentalist concept. So we have decided to publish another white paper on rise of Islamic militancy or rise of fundam Islamic fundamentalism in Bangladesh. And we have decided to include persecution of the Ahmadiyya Muslims or other secular Muslims like Humayun Nazad, you know, how he was killed. And there are a number of secular Muslim intellectuals have been persecuted during the last four years. Those will be included in our white paper on fundamentalism. So, cut it, to cut it a bit short, we have a few other speakers also. We have recommended few steps, one short term and a few steps, long term steps, to a stop persecution of the religious and ethnic minorities in Bangladesh. So let me read it from the, our you know, summary of the white paper. Number one, forming a high-profile commission comprising Supreme Court judge, Joint Secretary level representatives from the Home and Law Ministries and human rights organizations to verify incidents of the minority repression in last four years as reported in different newspapers and reviewing the reports and observation published by different national international rights organizations. The commission will submit its report in six months and made recommendations for stopping torture and discrimination to minority sects. Number two, the Wasted Property Act should be repealed immediately and compensation must be given to the victims of this black law. Three, the peace treaty signed between Chittagong Hill Church people and Bangladesh government on December 2, 1997 should be implemented immediately. Number four, the government will have to arrange compensation for different individuals and families irrespective of religion and ethnic identity who suffered for communal violence in the last four years, the land, households, and property now in capture of other people should be returned to the real owners. Number five, steps should be taken to dispose under trial cases quickly and unwanted political and administrative influence in probe and trial should be stopped. A strong mass awareness is necessary for long term program. <coughs> if we want to stop communal violence and minority persecution permanently, we need one, secular constitution, which will not create any discrimination in the name of religion, color, wealth, gender, and ethnicity. The 1972 constitution can be a model with a few amendments. It, didn't, it did not recognize separate entity of the indigenous ethnic communities, which is important to be in any civilized country. Number two, only a secular and democratic state can ensure equal rights and dignity to all people irrespective of religion, caste, property, language, ethnicity. 
different initiatives taken by newspapers, intellectuals, and the civil society can create these values. Secular human values cannot flourish without a strong civil society movement. Number three, education is considered as the backbone of a nation. There should be no education system in the country that creates negative ideas among the students about different religion, language, and ethnicity. The madrasa education has to be modernized, scientific, and to the people. Number four, a special opportunities and facilities in education and professional arena should be created for the communities and the groups of people that are now lagging behind due to deprivation and negligence over a long time so that this large manpower can take part equally in building the nation. Number five, we have learned from the newspaper reports and observation of the rights organization, including Nirmul Committee, that the repression this time has taken place more in rural areas than urban areas. Different socio-cultural and non-government volunteer organizations should initiate long-term steps in rural areas to form and expedite progressive cultural movement, including human and scientific education in remote areas in order to remove narrow-mindedness, conservative attitude, and evil act of the uneducated mullahs. Six, qualification should be prerequisite for government jobs, not religion. We cannot hope overall development of the country until non-Muslim citizens of the country remain deprived of the opportunity to prove their ability in policy making in the arena of politics, administration, economy, society, education, judiciary, and culture. All sorts of written and unwritten restrictions and communal mentality prevailing in these cases should be eliminated. So these are the few suggestions what we proposed in the white paper. Now a million dollar question. Many may ask why the government will do this when they are always denying of communal repression and human rights violation, especially when this is against their political goal. The reply is no country can survive alone in this world. There is no reason to believe that international community will remain indifferent to continuous religious minority and ethnic repression forever in a poor country poor and densely populated country like Bangladesh. People are forced to take shelter in other countries because of repression. Those who are well off taking shelter in Europe and US, while those who not go to neighboring India. Apart from increase of the population in other countries, this migration will create different kind of political, economical, social and cultural and law and order problems there, which may result ultimately in in unexpected interference by other countries. This interference could be multidimensional, which we cannot approve. However, it, if cause of the problems remains for an, an indefinite period, other countries may interfere even if we do not want. If the helmsmen of the coalition government have least sympathy for the country, they have to do without any delay all what is necessary to stop minority repression, to establish equal rights, dignity to all citizens, irrespective of religion, caste, language, ethnicity. If the government does not want or fail to do this, all patriotic forces will have to unite and form resistance movement to force the government to fulfill the demand in an ultimate bid to save the country and the people. So this is our view. You may add, you may differ, but we would like to, you know, but it's very urgently needed. The persecution on religious and ethnic minorities as well as political opposition, political parties and free thinkers in Bangladesh has to be stopped at any cost. Thank you very much. Okay, I suggest we move straight to the next speakers and then have a discussion all together of all kinds of points. I think this would be better than breaking things up now. Uh, and you are here, so... Yeah. Uh, oh, Mr. Can I? Uh, yeah. I yes, I do know, I do know. Yeah. Uh, and so we'll take you next. Yeah.
you want me to smack it? Uh, yeah. yeah, however you wish. Um, no, you, I want, want, you want to stand okay. up? Okay. okay, yeah. Well, I won't be speaking like the last speaker about the problems within Bangladesh, but speaking from our side uh, of what we can do to assist the people of Bangladesh. Liberation was formed in 1954 uh, by uh, Fenner Brockway, and in 1967 we changed the name from the Movement for Colonial Freedom to Liberation. Uh, the idea being that all countries were now liberated and they would be building their own societies uh, and moving ahead. Um, it's my predecessors that were always uh, supported uh, the struggles within Bangladesh uh, and the peoples uh, from Bangladesh, but uh, I feel that from my point of view, we've found that we've come face to face with the Bangladeshi governments in the United Nations when we have spoken about the tragedies within uh, the uh, uh, country and uh, with regard to the poverty, with regard to the uh, uh, persecution of religious minorities and uh, the Chittagong Hill tracks, we supported the peace accord, we spoke about that and then we've got reported as an, an NGO uh, to the secretariat in the United Nations as uh, giving wrong facts. Uh, and I said this last June, and we hoped that uh, we would be getting some uh, direct information from uh, Bangladesh. Uh, we do get it through the organization here, and uh, one of uh, your people sits on our central council now, and uh, we are sort of moving ahead. We've sent a resolution uh, condemning the situation in Bangladesh to the government here, uh, to the uh, uh, um, embassy, but no reply to date. Uh, and so what we think we might now do is to go to the embassy and say, why no reply? What is going on? We are asking serious questions. Uh, we are worried about the peoples uh, in Bangladesh and the minority groupings. And I think it's very important that although you speak to each other about the situation and it's of great concern to you all, for us on the outside, we need to know more about the facts so that we can use it within our uh, community, with our, within our democracy, and ask the government, what are you doing about the situation in Bangladesh? What are you doing about the banning of uh, uh, religious minorities in Bangladesh? What is happening? And we need the evidence to come to us so that we can begin to spread it much more widely. I know that Amnesty uh, has a, uh, its role and it does put out information about the situation. But some of us who are smaller NGOs can do different types of work and it's therefore that that is very important and I think uh, we uh, appeal to you uh, to give us the facts, give us the information so that we can help you in your struggles. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Abbas Fez is here from Amnesty International um, and I understand that Justice Manik is also here. Uh, it's you, all right. Uh, so I'll call you in a moment, uh, if you don't mind. But over to Abbas, you were also okay. there in June. Um, uh, and, yes. uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I am going to be very brief because I think, you know, uh, in the face of that monumental work that Shalio has done, and I have been aware of the fact that he has been working on that. I mustn't actually speak too long. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to really remind everybody, those of you who haven't actually seen our latest report, is uh, that I'd like you to have a, you know, to, to know about it. Uh, this is a report that we published this August, and it is called Bangladesh, 
human rights defenders under attack. It is the outcome of about two years of work with human rights defenders in Bangladesh, uh, including uh, Shari Al Kabir, who featured prominently in this report, and I think, I believe actually your photograph is also here in a different uh, uh, outfit. So uh, what I would like to say is that this report actually creates a con the context, speaks about the context in which human rights violations in Bangladesh are taking place. And when I speak about human rights violations, it also includes the human rights violations against members of the Hindu minority. So what we are talking about here is in the context, the um, concept of political polarization, what does it mean in Bangladesh? We know that the entire society probably is not unfair to say that the entire society is actually divided along the political lines. And unfortunately, this is a division. Uh, and I can say it as an independent observer that uh, runs through the civil society at large. Um, so it is something that we have to take into consideration when we are talking about uh, human rights violations. Then we've got, there is a culture of gun violence, unfortunately. And, and we know that the recent uh, rise in violence is within this culture of gun violence. Uh, and, and we know that you know, each of the political parties have got their own um, student groups, and we know who they are. And you know, these were the student groups who initially actually started off very um, kind of, you know, um, with, with determination to bring uh, back democracy into the country. And they are the remnants of the groups that were active uh, in the 1990s, when the um, when when uh, General Ershad's regime was toppled, but then after that, they were not dismantled, uh, decommissioned. So each of the political parties have got their own. And in addition to that, we we know that you know there are, as uh, Sharia was mentioning earlier, there are militant Islamic groups who are also part of this culture of gun violence. Uh, there are former Maoist groups who, or perhaps uh, they don't call them Mao, they don't call themselves Maoist anymore, but there are remnants of that movement who are part of this culture of gun violence. And the people who are suffering are people like yourselves, ordinary people, families, members of the minorities, uh, human rights defenders, journalists, uh, and, and there is a good account of the type of um, violations and abuses that journalists particularly are facing in Bangladesh here. Yes. Sorry, I'm going to have this. Am I going beyond my No, 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 no. Yeah. So, Another issue that Sharia was also mentioned, and I'd like you to also have a look at it from our perspective and angle, is the tension between secularism and religious-based politics. And Sharia very rightly emphasized that in Bangladesh, when they speak about secularism, it is not something very, very unusual. It's not a denial of the fact that people can have their own religions. What they mean by that is, uh, is the separation of religion from politics. So that is when they speak about secularism, that is what they mean. So that is another context within which these human rights violations are taking place. I mean, I won't go into all the details of what we've got here because you could have a look at it. You could get this also online can go to Amnesty's website, uh, which is www.amnesty.org. So, and then if you go to the library, you'll get all of these. Um, 
another major problem that we are facing in Bangladesh, again, as, as the human rights context in which these human rights violations are taking place, is the fact that the liberal space appears to be shrinking. And there are attacks against people who are um, exercising their right to freedom of expression, freedom of association, people who are taking action in order to defend other people's human rights. And of course, Sharia is a prime example of that. We know that in uh, October 2001, there were mass attacks in September and October against members of the Hindu minority in Bangladesh. Hundreds of Hindu families actually fled the country and they went across the border into India. And there were very few people to have the determination and the courage to go and investigate and, and document the atrocities that they had, uh, they had endured, they had suffered. And, and the only person from what I remember who actually did this, or the first person at least, was uh, Sharia. Uh, he went to the, and I, I don't know if you've actually covered that yeah. in, your, in your speech. Anyway, so I won't go into the details of that. He came back with a lot of documents about what he had actually seen and observed. Uh, I think there were videotapes, there were notes, there were um, history. There, yeah, there were photographs and all of that. And of course, immediately as he arrived in Bangladesh, and that was in November to November. Yeah, 2001. As he arrived, he was arrested, taken into detention, and he was in, in custody for a very long time. Um, all his books, did they actually return any of that? Yeah, nothing was returned including my back video to him. Camera. So when we speak about, you know, the shrinker, the attack on the liberal space, the attack against human rights defenders, it is a very, very serious and, and, and uh, an important issue. So after his return, he was de in detention, he was charged with sedition. Sedition for what? So you have to ask that question. For going to document atrocities that have been experienced by a section of the population who have had no other way of defending themselves but to flee that particular situation. So we are really talking about you know, some kind of an organized attack against human rights defenders. This attack is, is, is at the level of, uh, um, at, at the legal level, at the legal of, level of implementing uh, the laws and the way they use the legal system, which, in my opinion, is the abuse of the, uh, of the judicial system, is to bring uh, unsubstantiated <coughs> criminal charges against those who take action to support or defend human rights defenders, uh, <coughs> people who are, who are uh, subjected to human rights violations. And I'd like to just uh, make a reference in this report to <clears throat> one of the people who was accused of um, accused of uh, carrying out organized crime, and I'm just reading it from the report. Uh, he was accused of carrying out organized crime when insisting that the police should file the complaints of Hindu families who had suffered human rights abuses. So it's not just the, the fact that you know, there is no uh, prevention of the attacks against members of the minority, the, the, uh, the Hindu minority, at least at that time. Uh, later, the situation changed a little bit. But, but even when people, non-Hindus, were trying to help them, they were being accused of, you know, carrying out organized crime or all sorts of other uh, uh, concocted uh, charges, and then they were charged with criminal offenses. This particular person that I'm 
whose name I just mentioned. I didn't mention his name, but his name is Abul Khair. He has been. He he was subjected to a, a, a series of um, kind of uh, retaliatory action, including the filing of criminal charges. And when somebody is, when a criminal offense, a criminal charge is filed against someone. It is, it is just a form of harassment because they have to appear before court on a monthly basis. I think you still have to do yeah, that yeah, because the charges yeah, haven't been withdrawn yeah, against you. Yeah. So it, it is not that, you know, the, they do not provide enough substance for the charge to go to the court, and the court usually dismisses when, when it comes to the charges. So we know that. But that is not happening. So the charge is pending. The person has to appear before a magistrate once a month to um, satisfy the magistrate that they are still in the country. So it, it is very serious. It is, it is time consuming. For some people, they have to travel to other cities in order to appear before the magistrate in, in whose court, in whose presence this, file was, this, this case was filed. So we are talking about all of those things. And, uh, and, and I just want to, to say that uh, <clears throat> it is very important uh, to, to, to um, uh, urge the authorities in Bangladesh to carry out investigation of the attacks that are taking place. That is one of the major things. Uh, again, I think Shadia mentioned earlier, this you know, kind of immediate response seems to be a denial that something has happened. And if, if it is possible for that to, you know, to change, for that type of atti attitude to change, then that is really one step forward. So the next step would be to condemn these attacks, and that is really not what is happening. And it has to happen. The third stage would be to investigate these through you know, an investigation body, an investigating, an investigating body, which has three characteristics, which is it is independent, it is impartial, but more than all of those, it is competent. So it can't be just you know someone who actually doesn't have a clue about this uh, this issue. And of course, you know we we all want people who have been identified as the perpetrators uh, of these violations to be brought to justice. Of course, in a uh, in a in, in a trial that conforms to international, uh, internationally accepted fair trial uh, standard. So I think I've actually covered what I wanted yeah. to cover, so I'll just... Uh